What? Okay, uh, so let's continue with this, and then um, for week three, what we were, we were trying to study is the, is basically the basic idea of model fitting, uh, including introduction, uh, fitting models to data graphically, and analytical methods of model fitting, and uh, applying the least square criteria, and choosing a best model. So let's take a look. Uh, so so when we try to uh, uh, in the in the model model fitting process, three three ta tasks when we we are analyzing a collection of data points. These three tasks, including the number one, fitting a selected model types or types to the data, the precise meaning of the best model must be identified. So here, saying that essentially tell you that in order to see that which which model is the best? We do have a we do need to predefine a certain criteria. So, for example, we say okay, maybe the um, mean squared error is the least. That's one possibility. And then there are many other ways. There are many other ways to. Someone can still cannot hear or. Shaper said he still cannot hear me. Shepra, can you hear me okay now? Maybe you should log out and then try again. Okay, let's continue. Uh, so we have to identify certain specific criteria to to uh, measure the effectiveness of the model. Right, that's number one. Number two, choosing the most appropriate model from a competing types that have been fitted. So that's also the same thing. Um, uh, a criteria is needed for comparing models of different types. So models could be a graphical model. Um, graphical model could be simulation, could be a mathematical model, uh, could be anything that uh, uh, that uh, we. Uh, we, we come up with. And then uh, on top of that, one more step would be making predictions from the selected data. Uh, and then um, similarly, we need a criteria to, uh, to determine how to make predictions. And then sometimes we use, uh, use some type of test called out of sample test. Uh, going back to the history, using a subset of the data and run a model and then based on the subset of data you can create a model and then you use the rest of the data as a, as a benchmark data set to compare if you do a prediction to compare how good the model is. So that's one of the possibility. Um, one of the possibilities. So continue with this. Um, in, in the modeling process, all types of uh, uh, modeling error could be in place. One of them is formulation error, the other one is uh, truncation error, and runoff error, and measurement error. So when we do, when we, in a data collection process, most of the time, uh, if we have a, a data point that has uh, error, then it could be a measurement error. In that case, we need to look at the data itself and uh, understand the um, understand the understand the um, outliers whether whether there are some understand the distribution of the data itself. If we find an outlier from the data, then um, we just uh, we just need to. Then, if we find a problem with the data, then what we need to do is uh, we need to study the distribution of the data and then remove the outliers 
when needed. So it's always a good idea before you build any model, look at the data distribution first, understand the means and uh, standard deviation, etc. some of the key, ver key dimensions of the data first before you move on. And then, and then when you do the formulation, it's always the case that uh, you could have multiple formulations for the same problem. As I said, uh, modeling process itself is uh, art rather than mathematics in some regard. Every every different people might have give up uh, give a different answer to a specific uh, modeling process. Um, Mr. Carlos Sahili, you have questions. You said, uh, "Hey, I'm sending again." What did you say, send? No, sorry. Actually, it was me. Just actually, us. Uh, we are chatting in a private message uh, window. Uh, so it went to everyone. Sorry about that. Oh, you were talking to someone else. Okay. Yeah, right. Got it. Got it. Okay. Um, so, so continue with the com conversation. Um, Three point one is uh, was discussing uh, fitting models to data graphically. So uh, one thing is um, it, there's potential visual fitting has potential pitfalls. So when we look at the data, we think it might be fitting that way, but the reality could be when we use mathematic models, um, it's a different uh, function. So, but in this, in some regards, in many ways, visualization itself can help you to start. Um, and then remember that oftentimes when we when we cannot view the higher dimension data, we used uh, many types of data visualization methodology and data transformation methodology to decrease the dimensionality problem, which is part of the machine learning uh, key, which is part of the key elements of the machine learning methodologies. So if we have multi-dimensional data, how can, it, can we cluster it, how can we cluster data so that we can understand pieces of the data instead of the um, whole data set? Uh, understand understand the lower dimension of the data, which have a rather complete picture of the whole data set. That's the whole purpose of uh, dimension reduction. And then, um, so in figure 3.2, I'm sure you, you guys probably already read that part, but in general, uh, we used Chapter first approximation method to um, uh, to to be modeled as a minimization problem. Um, however, that minimization problem is uh, essentially is a linear prob problem that we did, which which we will discuss in much further detail in chapter seven. But in general, that actually gives you a sense on uh, what is a minimization problem and how can we set up the minimization problem. Um, and then um, one of the criteria we can we can use is called least square criteria, and and it's actually it is the so it is the um, the basics for linear regression. So we are going to discuss linear regression as well. We are going to discuss the linear regression as well later in the in the course. But that linear regression itself, the major criteria that we are going to use is the least squared error. So when we try to um, apply the least, least square criteria, we can do that. We can formulate a straight line, and then, and then we formulate the least squares, and then take partial derivatives of the least squares, and then set partial, partial derivatives to zero, solve for the slope and the intercept. And then that's, that's essentially is linear regression. And then in the chapter, we also discussed how we can fit in a power curve. Power curve itself is an introduction to nonlinear regression. And then on the other end, we can always transform 
least the square fifth transformation from nonlinear model to a linear model. So uh, that's the that's uh, actually have a very basic discussion about linear regression, and then and then we we talk about how we can uh, this how we can choose a best model. We can look at the fitting error, we can compare multiple models, and then in this scenario, we need to consider a couple of things. One is the error itself, and then we need to consider the complexity of the model and uh, overfitting of the model. So we are disc also last, actually in uh, 605, we studied the complexity versus overfitting stuff, which is uh, usually is considered as generalization of the model. We cannot fit the data too well, but it doesn't have uh, potential extendability or cannot be used for other, um, other different scenarios. So so that's some, some, some of the key aspects that we need to pay attention to. Okay, here actually uh, uh, the homework for chapter three, but you already studied that part. So let's move on to uh, week four material. Okay, so for week four, uh, we we are going to. Um, start study the simulation itself. So I know that you currently have a simulation course, uh, which is a new course, actually. So previously, we cover simulation uh, as a chapter in this particular course. So in any case, I'll go through this, this section so that if you have any questions after this, we can discuss. So simulation itself, uh, simulating uh, simulation can, can simulate deterministic behavior. Uh, for example, uh, we can simulate area under a specific curve. Simulation can uh, also involve generating random numbers, and then simulation can simulating probabilistic behavior. Uh, in the chapter, there is section discuss discussing the inventory model. If you don't really understand what is inventory model, you can study there. But in general, the idea is uh, for, a, for a distributor for, such, as, uh, such as Amazon, a specific question that they would be always facing in business would be uh, how much inventory I should be put in place so that uh, uh, when, a passenger, uh, when a customer actually orders something, I can uh, the, the company can ship the company in time. Uh, on the other hand, they do not want to put too much things in the inventory just because um, the, the, it involves a lot of uh, warehousing cost. Uh, meanwhile, they really don't want to lose a customer if someone was trying to buy something but they could not find it in their inventory. So it's a balance between the wearing, warehousing cost and a lost sale or un unsatisfied customer cost. So that's why it's part of also part of an inventory. Uh, uh, it's also part of optimization problem. So any any way any time when you meet a specific problem that involves multiple competing risks or multiple cost component, then it can be modeled as a as a uh, optimization model, and then. Why are we using simulation for here for this particular problem? When, when the problem itself has much more complexity and then it's very difficult to model as a specific mathematic modeling problem, people start thinking about simulation. In other words, if you can model a specific problem mathematically, you don't really want to try simulation. So simulation itself should be applied to really complicated problems that is uh, difficult to explain by some simple form of math mathematics. And then 5.5 uh, discuss queuing models. Queuing models itself is part of the stochastic process problem. And then uh, for simple problems, they can be modeled mathematically, even though for complicated queuing system, you have to use simulation. 
So what is a queuing system? For example, when you go to um, when you go to Walmart and trying to uh, check out any of the checkout station. So if we model the prop, if we can model the distribu distribution of the time that each a customer is spending at a specific um, um, teller, and then you could model the pro problem rather easily. And also, if you can model the distribution of uh, arrivals of all the customers, you can model this rather model this uh, process relatively easily. But on the other end, some of the uh, mathematics cannot. It's difficult to deal with the situation that. If a customer waits in a specific line more than two minutes, he jumped to a different line. Or there's a customer waited for, for a, a waited in a specific line for five minutes. He decided to go somewhere else to get a cup of coffee and come back and check out. This type of behavior is rather difficult to model mathematically. So. So that's why we started thinking about using queuing mod using simulation to model complicated queuing systems. Here there's a discussion of uh, the rationale for using simulation models. So as I mentioned earlier, when, when it is unable or difficult to construct an analytical model adequately explaining the behavior observed, we start thinking about simulation. And then simulation is another way. On the other end, simulation is one way to obtain data needed for further analysis. And then, um, and then, another reason that we use simulation, one more reason that we use simulation is because there is really no alternative procedures that th that exist that you can test a certain behavior. So you, you try to mimic the reality using simulation process to. Um, uh, to run a, a simulation model to to understand the the whole process. Okay, so here in the textbook there is a specific section talk about simulating this deterministic behavior. Um, for example, area under a curve. So so the basic idea is we can you know in this in this square area. What we can do is we're trying to throw random numbers, try to see where it lands up. If it lands in the in the on, on above the curve, then we don't count. If it turns out that it is land in underneath the curve, then we start counting the number of points that actually land beneath the curve versus above the curve. By doing that multiple times, many 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 times. We can calculate the area that is actually under this curve. Um, as an application of this methodology, um, we can sub assume that we have a square. I think this is probably one of the homework. Assume that we have a square um, area we define, and then we have a circle on in inside the inscribed in the square. Area and then if we want to approximate the pi value, how can we use this approach to by throwing the dots and then use the area of the uh, circle divided by the area of the square equals to um, that probability that you can calculate based on this and then area of the circle is pi r squared and then we can calculate what the pi is. That's one of the homework. You can take a look and see um, that give you uh, some idea about um, how we can apply this methodology. This is simulating deterministic uh, behavior area under a curve. And then similarly, in this example, we're saying, okay, what if it's a volume instead of a, a two-dimensional space? We can do the same thing. Volume under the service surface divided by volume of the box roughly is number of the points counted below surface in the first octant divided by total number of points. That's one way to, to get the volume on a curve. 
Now, uh, next that we discuss how we can generate some random numbers. So, so, so assume that we can um, start with a four-digit number x0. That usually is called the seed. The seed is the starting number for a sequence of random numbers. And then we can square it to obtain a eight-digit number and add a leading zero if necessary, saying that if it's not if it's not a digit, then we add a leading zero. And then we take the middle four digits as the next random number. So we keep running this, and then we can get a sequence of number. This is called um, middle square method for generating uh, random numbers, uh, generating random numbers. And then you might be wondering, why do we need a set of random numbers? So the idea essentially is, we can do. We can generate. Assume that we generate a thousand sequence of random numbers, starting from the first number, and then do some calculation with your function, and then get a specific value of your function, and continue with the second random number, ca calculating the function value, get the second value for your function. Keep going through that. Those one thousand, on average, you can use the average to approximate your function value. That's the whole idea of the simulation itself. Essentially, meaning that generating a, a sequence of uh, sequence of random numbers and then try to evaluate a specific function. For example, it could be the inventory system, could be the queuing system, could be any complex system, and then evaluate your function to get a value, get an output. Could be output, could be, for example, could be a, a average time in queue for a customer in the, in a waiting line, things like this. And then we can understand the system behavior. That's the purpose of uh, simulation and also the purpose of uh, random number generation. And then there's another very popular method is called linear concurrence method. The idea is we use a starting seed number. We use constant A, B, and C to get the next number. The, the formulation is A times the first previous number plus B mod C to get the, get the, um, get the remainder of the modulus modulus function that would be the next next um, random number. And here C is a modulus, A is a multiplier, and the B is called the increment. And then you have to pay attention to the random number you generated. Possible, it's it's very possible that uh, the random number that you generated has cycles. However, we hope that this length of the cycle is rather rather long, meaning that you cannot generate a number and then it's only after ten numbers you see another cycle. Then it's very difficult for you to evaluate anything or any of the major behavior of the system that you're trying to understand. So in one of the homework too, uh, we, we have um, we have some problem that to talk about um, when you generate some numbers, whether it's, it has cycle, and then how can you identify that cycle. And then um, on the other end, um, you need to do this, do some uh, random, uh, do some uh, sanity check on how, uh, whether the the uh, um, the lack of you have to understand the independence whether the the data set has uh, statistical independence among the members in the list of random numbers. Um, so Daniel had a question asking about. Yes, actually, my bad. It should be correct. Yeah, for the four digit thing is when you square, you have to pad the number, pad it to double the length of starting number each in each iteration. That's correct. Yeah. And then um, we just studied how to uh, simulate deterministic behavior. Now let's look at uh, how to simulate probabilistic behavior. So for example, uh, if we want to study the, 
for for example if we want to um, study uh, three simple probabilistic models when flip a few corn or ref, roll a field die and roll a row of uh, unfair die or a pair of unfair dice. And then uh, there's examples there, but let's continue for a fair coin. We, what coin, we, what we can do is, um, uh, the input would be the total number of n of the random flips of a fair coin to be generated in the simulation. And then the output is the probability of getting ahead when flip a fair coin. And the initialization is counter equal to zero, and then for the steps, for i equal to 1 to, until all the way to n, we need to do steps 3 and 4. For step, step 3, obtain a random number xi between 0 and 1. And then step 4 is, if xi is between 0 and 0 0.5, then the counter equals to counter equals plus 1. Otherwise, leave counter as is. And then step 5 is calculate p head equal to counter divided by n and then output the probability of the head. So we know it should be a half. But by, do, by doing simulation, we can prove that if you run 1,000 uh, simulate rounds, you probably cannot get 0.5. But if you do 10,000, I'm sure you will get um, very close to 0.5, if not precise to be 0.5. So that's one example. Um, it's also called simulation itself. It's also called Monte Carlo simulation. Remember that. I'm sure that you probably will study more in the other course too. And then similarly for dice, what we can do is the output with the percentage of probability for rows to be 1 to 6. And then you can do the same thing. You can uh, initialize a counter, uh, counter 1 to counter 6 to 0. And then for step 2, you start uh, for all the, all the each, uh, each, uh, Run, you do steps three and four, you obtain a random number satisfying between zero and one, and then if xi is between zero and uh, one over six, counter one will be added by one. If on the other hand, else, if it's between one six to two six, then counter two will be added by one. So as you can um, think about this process, it's uh, rather straightforward. But on the other end, what if you have unfair dice? That would be the example for uh, next um, slide. So if you have unfair dice, assume that the random number you got is between 0 and 0, uh, 0.1, then the counter 1 would be added 1. So essentially, you already know how unfair the die itself is. So in this particular, particular case, we're saying that uh, for the first outcome, it is uh, 10, uh, 1, 0.1 over 1, which is 10%. And then for the second outcome, it's also 10%. For the third outcome, it's around 20%. For the four, number 4 outcome, it's 30%. And then or the fifth outcome is 10%. And the sixth, sixth uh, outcome is 10% too. So that's how you can simulate this unfair die, uh, situation. But the model itself, rather simple, if you try to write it, code it in R, uh, it's re relatively straightforward there. Um, even though here we didn't discuss how can you generate a random number like what we said, linear congruent methodology. But we, we discussed that. But really, in reality, when you use your R program, you can just uh, get a random number by calling some of the functions and get, get your random number there. Remember that the random number, we call it pseudo-random. One of the major reasons is because of the cycles, because of the, uh, mainly because of cycles, meaning it's not really random. It's, uh, it's pseudo-random. OK, in an example for the inventory model, assume that uh, we can, uh, the, the, the book actually um, try to approximate, approximate the average daily cost as a function of storage cost, delivered, delivery cost, and the demand rate. And then the, the model itself have, have, has assumptions 
on demand levels and frequency um, of the demand level. Just pay attention that some of the assumptions for simulation models may be results from analytical models. What does that mean? For example, the assumptions for demand levels. Demand level itself could be an um, analytical model. You use your forecasting methods to give a specific number for different, different, um, different uh, demand level or on a specific day for different levels of demands. So that's why that's that's one one possibility. But on the end, on the other end, simulation results can be an input for analytical methods, right? So that's why, uh, even though earlier I mentioned that if you can analyze the problem itself analytically or mathematically, you don't really want to use simulation simulation model because of the inaccuracy or approximation of the simulation model itself. But on the other end, we really just use them kind of in a, in a more integrated way. Say here, we, we mentioned that um, we can use simulation results to be the input of an analytical models, or we can use analytical models to be the input for simulation models. So in the model, uh, so in the inventory model, the basic idea is uh, we have a um, a couple of things. One thing is the current inventory, and then um, and then for the next inventory, for the next cycle, uh, the quantity that we got for uh, during the quantity the quantity that we got for the delivery, the one that we got we got to increment our inventory. And then C, I think C was um, the C is C is a okay. I need to check. Um, hold on. Um, I don't have the book handy. Um, it's not it's not uh, a electronic, electronic version version, but in any case here D I'm sure it's demand. But the idea is um, using um, for all the periods using a step is generate a random number x and try to compute QI using the demand sub model and then update the current inventory by doing this and by doing minus the demand and then compute the delay storage cost and the total running cost unless the inventory has been depleted and then um, and then if i less than zero then set i equal to zero and go to step nine in step nine what you otherwise you do this to change i think this is a cost function probably uh, c equal to c plus i times s storage cost i think yes this is a c is a star, um, cost function and then step nine is decrement the number of days remaining in the simulation, k in, meaning uh, dec decrement k equal to k minus one. K is the total number of days that you are trying to simulate. And then the whole um, whole idea is uh, how can we um, compute the average average daily cost? Yes, c is the cost function. So use c equal to all, all, all the costs divided by n days. So this is one way to simulate the um, cost for an inventory uh, system. So in a, in a textbook, there are a couple of um, queuing models, that uh, queuing examples. So the example that was given was a harbor system. And then in the cases that when the system is very complex to be modeled by analytical models, sim simulation can help quite a bit. In the harbor system model, you, you can see that it's impossible for us to do the analytical model. It's rather, even though what, after we use simulation, we can um, do some simple average or do some uh, analytics on the model results to understand the um, harbor system. So again, subsystems might be models using analytical models. And then you should review page 216 of the textbook 
for the hub system simulation algorithm. And then there are some, some more um, mo uh, examples in the textbook, including morning rush hour and then multiple server queues. As you can imagine, this can be used in supermarkets to exp estimate how many servers um, checkout booths might be needed. That's one of the key um, application for simulation, uh, even for, we should say that that's a key application for queuing systems. For queuing systems, if it's, um, if the arrival and the service um, distribution, distribution is, can be modeled rather uh, rather accurately using specific distribution, I mean, di specific distribution, you should be able to analyze the system uh, using mathematic model. That is called, uh, uh, for example, MM1Q, which is assuming that uh, the arrival of the process is a Poisson distribution, and then the service time that that uh, each customer experience is uh, simul is a uh, is a exponential distribution. So actually, with that, I actually want to show you something that's rather quickly on the MM1Q and um, some other major uh, queuing models, so that you can get a sense how that can be analyzed mathematically. And then this is a list for the homework. Uh, again, you only need to submit three of those uh, five, uh, any any three that you think that uh, makes sense for you. But it's it's worth to um, at least understand what the problem is, take a look if you don't have time to finish all of them uh, by yourself. I mean, if you cannot finish all of them uh, this week. So the basic idea is uh, suppose it's also considered as a birth and te death process. The reason we call it M, M, and one, meaning that there is only one server, and then only one server, and then there is a waiting area. The arrival is um, is a Poisson process with a lambda as the distribution, and then the service itself using mu as a exponential service time uh, as a exponential distribution. So here it says, okay, it represents where the arrivals are determined by a Poisson process and job service times have an exponential distribution. And then um, the basic idea is let's use a state space to define the current state in the, in the system. Suppose there's zero customers or one or two or three keep going. And then we would say that when there's one arrival in the system, which have a rate of lambda, then we can uh, we can go to state two, one. And, and meanwhile, if there is another one coming into the system, it goes to two, right? On the other end, if the one of the service is complete, then one becomes zero. So this is a whole representation of the of the whole system. And then we can use a simulate. Uh, we can use a matrix to represent this. Uh, this behavior, and then this behavior is uh, from suppose the state would be zero to zero, zero to one. But remember that from zero to anything else should be summed up to zero. In that case, if the probability from zero to one is lambda, and then on the other end zero to zero for the, should be negative lambda. So because we know zero cannot jump to to two directly in this particular case, meaning that we have the assumption that zero, zero, number, zero people in a number will not jump to two directly. That's why you can see that for, um, for one, it can only go to two or go back to one or stay in the in uh, state itself. So 
So this would be the matrix that can model this uh, this system. And then, of course, we have some 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 sort of uh, assumptions there, such as arrival occurs as Poisson, service time have an exponential distribution with uh, one over mu as a parameter, and also it is a single server queue. And then it follows first comes first serve discipline, and then the buffer uh, is of infinite size, meaning that uh, you can have as many um, people in the queue as possible. And then mathematically you can solve this to see that um, the, here is the mathematical function to see uh, I think this is would be the um, probability that there are key customers in the system would be represented this way, right? And then we analyze the stationarity of the problem and then try to get uh, uh, some some f analytical function of the busy period of the server and the response time of the server and uh, things like that. However, we can, on the other end, we can really use simulation to sim simulate this process. So whenever there is a customer coming into the sign, into the line, you increment increment some certain parameters in the system, and then whenever there is a customer leaves the service station, you can decrement some other parameters in the same system. And then, with that being said, you would understand when a specific customer arrives and then when a specific customer started uh, the service being serviced and then when the customer was uh, was uh, done with his uh, work and then he can leave the he can leave the system so if we track all the specific time stamp uh, time stamp of the customer in system we can understand that some of the key um, some of the key parameters that will be interested in the system, such as average time in queue, uh, average average time in service, etc. Right. So that's the whole idea of the simulation itself. Even though this is a mathematical representation, I'm trying I'm trying to bring up this uh, question so that you can understand how the simulation can be used in this particular scenario. So assume that the arrival is no longer uh, M, Poisson process, and the service time is, is no longer it's exponential, then it would be very difficult to analyze the problem analytically. But on the other end, we can use simulation to simulate complicated system, um, for even a simple system as, as this, this type of queue, but the distribution of the arrival and the service. Uh, is uncertain. Okay, um, that's pretty much everything that I want to talk about today. And um, uh, if you have any questions on this, hello. Oh, I didn't follow you guys. See the total running cost. Thank you, Nandy. Okay, so um, you guys have any questions so far? Okay, if not, I just want to say that uh, for some logistics, uh, why is the why is that? Uh, um, Homework one, two, three. You you guys already uh, submitted, but probably some of you got the late warning. That's because I didn't uh, put the change the date to 2015. I only changed the date, forgot to change the year. So I'm going to fix that for the coming submission. So no worries about being late for the first three because of that. And then um, and then another thing is um, I'm going to try to create homework one, homework two this week. So hopefully you can get back your homework uh, one, two by end of this week. And then I'm going to try to grade homework three and four next week. And then hopefully we will be in sync by end of next week. So 
um, that's all for this. And then I don't have any other things that I would like to cover. If you don't have any questions, um, uh, I'll just stop here. And uh, um, you can always reach out to me by email. By the way, if you actually really have some questions, I think it's better to send me an email instead of asking in the Blackboard system, unless you think it's worthwhile to discuss with other fellow students in the forum. Because, um, because I don't really check a Blackboard system like uh, every day, but I, I try to check my email every day. OK, um, so everybody, um, good night. And uh, I'll talk to you uh, in two weeks. Also, I will be hosting office hours next next Wednesday, starting from 8. I, will, I, try, I tend to stay there for 20 minutes, around 20 to 20 minutes also, if no one joins me. So from 8 to 8.15 or 8.20, if no one is, uh, is there, I'll just uh, drop the line. Anyway, uh, good night, and uh, let's talk, talk more in two weeks.